to Mount Zion this morning. If you'll stand this morning, we are going to open up service. Let's praise the Lord for this morning.
you may be seated. Hey there, Mount Zion family. I just wanted to let you know we are all alive and well. And I thought I'd take a moment to let you know what we are doing the few days leading up to our clinics, which begin on Monday. Right now, Bob and I are headed back to the airport. Bob is right here with me, and uh, we are headed there to pick up more people who will be on the team. And then we will be processing eyeglasses and medicines and making sure that everything is a go for first thing on Monday morning. So there is a lot to do in preparation uh, for treating 1,800 people. So I uh, wanted you to uh, be aware of, uh, or be aware of what we're doing. I thought about waiting until the airport, but then I thought better of it. They do not allow anybody to take any uh, pictures uh, at the airport. But we are having a good time. I would ask that you continue to pray for Kathy. Uh, her poison ivy is now infected, but she's under a doctor's care. And, uh, and we think that everything's going to be uh, just fine. We're going to have a great time. And uh, I'm going to be sending you a clip of some slides that Anna will be uh, putting to music. And it will be some pictures of where we are staying. And it will also be a picture, let me tell you a story and close with this. Uh, yesterday, uh, Bob and Angie and some of the others uh, wanted to take us to Pimienta. The uh, pastor that is serving there now he is helping us on the team as one of the nationals. And, um, and it was where Kathy and I served 12 years ago. There was one family that was particularly special to us. There was a little girl who was two years old that uh, during a worship service came and crawled up in Kathy's lap. And it just began a wonderful, wonderful uh, time of love with that particular family. So we are sending you some pictures. That two-year-old girl is now 13, almost 14. Now she, uh, small frame, she doesn't look, she doesn't hardly look at day over 10 or 11. But, uh, but anyway, uh, we'll be sending you some pictures of a church that I preached in. And whenever I preached in it, the roof wasn't even on the church yet. And, uh, and people were sitting in the windows. So you'll see some pictures that's coming up of uh, some memories uh, that were reclaimed yesterday. Uh, whenever Kathy and I went before, it was such an incredible reunion. Uh, please take a moment right now to pray for us as uh, we get ready to start our clinics on Monday. Thank you so much. God bless you. Say bye, Bob. Bye. All right, we'll see you. God bless you.
stand. We're going to sing one more time before. Uh,
Smith's Kids Club. So kids, if you want to, go ahead and go downstairs. I'm sure by the end of the month that uh, kids will get better at this and then we have to raise our hand, your hands. They'll just come and catch you for money. And we may have to ask the trustees for a bigger church. I'm not for sure. Uh, but uh, at this time, uh, I'd like to introduce our, our guest speaker for not only this morning, but for next Sunday as well, uh, Mr. Glenn Jenkins. Uh, he has graciously accepted to fill in in Pastor Mike's absence, which is great for us because Eric and I would otherwise have to ask for volunteers, and I don't know that anyone is up to that or wants to be up to that right now, so I will forego the formal introduction. I'll let Glenn, he has been here several times, twice, okay, he's been here twice before, so he's not unfamiliar to us, so uh, at this time I would just welcome uh, Mr. Glenn Jenkins. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, 
For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto you that your name is Peter, but, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now that was in that day. He doesn't tell us not to say it today, right? Okay. And so that was at that time for that place. In our scripture lesson for today, we find that there are two great confessions that are made. The first one is a confession that the church makes about Christ. And then the second one is a confession that Christ makes about his church. Today we will look at the first of these two great confessions, the confession that the church makes about its Christ. And I want you to notice, first of all with me, the place where this uh, confession or profession is made. The place is Caesarea Philippi. In the winter before Jesus' death, Jesus brought his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. It's an unusual place for him to take them. The city is mentioned only twice in the Bible, once here and once in Mark, but it's about the same event. And this is where Jesus first reveals to his disciples that he is the Messiah. This is the first time. It's a mystery why Jesus chose this place to reveal who he was to his disciples. Yet, I think there are some interesting clues that we might think about. You know, Jesus never did anything by accident. Everything he did, he did it on purpose. So when Jesus takes them to Caesarea Philippi to make this announcement to him about them, about that he is the Messiah, there's a purpose involved in that. And so the city... Uh, of Caesarea Philippi was also known as the ancient city of Paneas. And it was situated about 30 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. It was on a plateau at the foot of Mount Hermon. And this was about uh, 1150 uh, feet above sea level, this place where they went. The area was unusually a beautiful setting. It was very lush because of all the water that was there and full of life, and it has always been one of the main sources of the Jordan River. But the ancient uh, people, they built a shrine there at this location to Baal. The Greeks and the Romans also later built shrines there because there was a location of a mysterious cave which seemingly had a bottomless pit that had an unlimited quantity and supply of water, which made the pagan people marvel at this place. They named it the Cave or the Grotto of Pan. Pan is a very interesting word, and it was the name of a Greek god. You know, all of the people in the ancient Near Eastern uh, area they were pagan people and they believed in many gods. And the name Pan, or the word Pan, actually means many. That's the word that we use in panorama. I mean, you know, it encompasses many things. And so that means many. And the people who worship many gods, those people, they called it pantheism, okay? And so the not only the people of the Canaanites, but also the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and uh, the Greeks and the Romans, all of these people were pantheistic. They believed in many gods. And so Jesus has brought these disciples to this place where it was known for the worship of many gods. It's a natural feature there, and not only it impressed the Greeks, but it, they believed that Caesarea Philippi to be the dwelling place of their gods, and nothing produced more 
awe or and terror than the place identified as this cave where the god Pan, they believe, dwelt. You know, uh, uh, Pan does... <laughs> you, you've seen pictures of what they call Pan? Okay. Pan was uh, pictured as a creature with a human torso and head. Okay. But he had the body of a goat and the feet and also the horns of a goat and the ears of a goat. If you've ever seen that picture, it's hideous. But that was their picture of this god Pan. Okay. But Caesarea Philippi was the home of this pagan Greek gods, and they referred to this place as the gates of death or the gates of Hades or the gates of hell. And so it was at this place, the gates of the pagan gods, the gates, you might say, of hell, that Jesus turned to his disciples and asked them this first important question. He said, who do men say that I am? Okay. Jesus is asking them, what have you heard other people say? Did he ask them that question because that he didn't know? <laughs> I, I doubt that. But he asked them that question. What have you heard people say about me? What are they talking about? What are they calling me? Uh, how are they identifying me? Well, they began to answer. One of them said, well, I think I've heard that you were, they said you were John the Baptist. But they believe that. They believe he came back alive, right? Okay. But anyway, they said John the Baptist. If somebody said, well, I think I've heard somebody say you were Elijah. And another one piped up and said, I believe that you are Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. And another uh, said, others said, or another prophet, or another prophet. They began to give him the answers of what they had heard people say about Jesus. Let me ask you something. What does the world say about Jesus today? The people that don't know him, what do they say about Jesus today? If you hear them to say, well, he was just a, a man, you hear them say, well, he was a great man, you, you know. And they might say, well, he was a great teacher. They might even say, well, he was a prophet. I remember one time uh, when I was first pastoring a pastor church in, in the uh, suburb, suburbs of Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, the interesting thing was there's a hospital there, but one of our members of our church was a I worked at the hospital. And so I visited there quite a bit, of course, as a pastor. And was there one day, and I met her at the hospital. And she was saying, Pastor, I, I want you to wait here just a moment. The lady that's coming who works here uh, with us at the station, she said, I want you to meet her. And so she introduced me to this lady. And this lady uh, was, uh, she was an Islamic lady. And so, that was back in the days when I didn't know tact too well, I guess. Sometimes I tried to be a little bit more diplomatic than I was probably at that time. But anyway, uh, we talked and said hello and those kind of things. But then uh, I asked her some questions about Islam. And, and I said uh, to her, uh, what do you believe about Jesus? Hey, that's always a good question. What do you believe about Jesus? And she said, uh, well, we believe that he was one of God's prophets. And Islam does believe that. And I said, well, do you believe the truth, that he spoke the truth of God? And she said, yes, we do. I said, well, then why do you not believe that he's who he said he was? That he is the Son of God, that he is the Savior of the world. And that ended the conversation she walked away. What I want to say to you this morning is, does Jesus care what the world says about him? I believe he does. But I believe there's something more important that Jesus is concerned about, not what the world, who does not know him, says about him, but I think he's more important about what do those who say they know me, what do they say about me? <coughs> what are they professing about me and confessing. Before we go any further, I want to just sort of have a little background study with you on the word profession. The 
most common definition of profession is, and somebody asks you, what is your profession? Many times people say, well, that's what I do. I work. That's my work, my vocation, okay. or occupation. But the second most common definition of the word is, it's an act or instance of professing or declaring something. It's an open avowal uh, of a belief or an opinion. It's a solemn declaration that serves the same purpose as an oath. A profession of faith, a declaration of faith in a religion. Especially it's made on entering that group of people. What do you confess? What do you confess? Are you like us? What do you believe? That's very important. And so, that confession is a profession, an affirmation of acceptance of some religion or faith. You know, there are three religions in this world that are monotheistic. Now, we talk about pantheism, that means a belief in many gods, but monotheism means a belief in only one God. There are three religions that only believe in one God. And if we take them in the order of when they order of their existence, the first one would have been Judaism. That's the Jewish people. The second one would be Christianity. And the third one would be Islam. And so, each of these three has a definite professional statement or declaration of faith. That's interesting. Okay? The Jewish statement of faith, of course, good. the Jewish uh, people and a religion actually originated with Abraham. That would have been 2,000 years B.C., before Christ. But it was recorded, of course, by Moses 500 years later in the Old Testament in the first five books. And so, and the, that's their scripture, by the way, the Jewish people, their scripture is the Old Testament, the same as the one we have today. That's exactly the same word. But we do not tell them that that's the Old Testament. It's the Hebrew Bible. They call that their Bible, okay? Because they do not accept the New Testament. And so, their profession of faith is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9. In Hebrew, they call this the Shema, okay? Or Shema Israel, which means, Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. And this is what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Remember when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was of all? And he said the first and the greatest is what? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart. With all of thy heart, with all of thy soul, thy mind, and thy strength. That's the first and greatest commandment. He was what? He was stating their statement of faith. Okay. It was in their hearts and taught diligently to their children. Repeated every day in their homes. And also it was the beginning of every one of their worship services at the synagogue. That's the first thing they did was repeat the Shema, their confession of faith. It's interesting, I have had the privilege of being in most every dominant Jewish group that there is. The Orthodox, the Conservative, and the Reformed, and also the Messianic Jewish people. Okay? And they do begin their services with the Shema, their confession of faith. It's interesting that the difference is the Messianic Jews. They are the ones that have accepted Jesus as the Savior, as the Messiah. Okay? But they do not call themselves Christians. They call themselves completed Jews. Because the rest of them say, He's not come yet, we're still looking for Him. But they say, we found Him, and He's already here, and He lives in our heart, so we're completed Jews. That's what they say. And their confession is the same as Shema, and they believe in the Lord their God. Let's talk about Islam for a moment. That's certainly been interested in the 
last 20 years in our in our history. But Islam originated with Muhammad around 1610 AD. It's recorded in the Quran, in the Arabic. Their creed is called the Shahada. And this is what they say. It literally means a witnessing. But it states this. There is only one God and His name is Allah. And Muhammad is His prophet. Now when you say that, you're Muslim. With intent. The central statement of faith in Islam is recited ceremonially by new converts and it consists of an affirmation of their God and His prophet Muhammad. They repeat this. They have ritual prayers five times every day. And when they do, they stand and pray, they kneel and pray, and they prostrate themselves in prayer five times a day. And when they do, they all say this confession of faith that they have. There's only one God. His name is Allah, and His prophet is Muhammad. Well, the third one is Christianity. Christianity originated with who? With Jesus Christ. We'll say around 30 AD when he began his uh, public ministry in Judea. Of course, uh, it was in a uh, very early stage at that time. Somebody has said that the church came, uh, was born on the day of Pentecost. Well, the church may have been born on the day of Pentecost, but it's been under a gestational period ever since Jesus came and started his ministry. It just came to life at that time. And so, Jesus, though, let me say this. I want to say this to you. I have had to study all of these religions in seminary in, uh, in the degree that I took in evangelism and world uh, world missions and that was that there's only two of these three religions that believe in the same God that's Judaism and Christianity Islam does not believe in the same God that we believe in not at all they say they do it but they don't if you read it you will know it they do not they call him Allah and it's Mohammed is the prophet, the one who had the truth, okay? And so there's a great deal of difference, great deal of difference. They have their own scripture. They have their own uh, way of looking at the world. And they are very, very, very progressive. Now Jesus asked the second question. All of the world may say something about Jesus. People who do not know Him may call Him all kinds of names and they may say all things about Him. I've heard some people give Him names that you would not speak publicly. Let me tell you that this world who does not know Him don't know who He is and they may call Him all kinds of things but the truth is that He is what He's asking this question. Now who do you say that I am? He says to the disciples. I've heard you say what the world says, but what are you saying about Him? You who claim to know Him, you who have lived with Him, you who say you follow Him, you have been with me, you know me, now what do you say about me? That's the most important thing. Listen to me, church, the most important thing is what we are saying about Jesus Christ. That's our witness to the world. What we are saying, confessing about Jesus Christ. Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Who are you saying that He is? Who have I seen that he did? That's important. And Peter was usually the first one to speak. And Peter, the bold and straightforward one, speaks out for all of them. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Notice how definite and precise the confession that Peter is making. He says, you are. He didn't say you may be, or you were, or you're going to be. He said, you are. You are the Christ. The Christ. The is a definite article. It means one and only. 
You are the Christ, which is the anointed one of God. That's what that means. The Christ, the anointed one of God, which meant he was the Messiah. You are the Messiah, the Deliverer, the one that we've been looking for, the one that we've been longing for, the one that's been promised to us. You are Him. <laughs> You're Him. Hallelujah. The Son of the living God. That's interesting. That He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. Hey, there's only one living God. All the rest of them dead. Or they can't speak, or they can't talk. Why would anybody in the world make up a God with their hands and then worship it? And you tell me that now. But it's no different than people making up one in their minds and saying that's who God is. Yes, He's the Son of the living God. You are the one. The one we've been praying for, longing for, looking for. You are the one from God, our Deliverer, our Savior. And Jesus said to him, Peter, you didn't get this out of the book and you didn't get it from some teacher somewhere. Today we might have said, you know, you didn't hear it from the anchor person on the news channel or you didn't get it from the, the uh, I guess, newspaper or the editorial section. You didn't hear it there. Where did you hear it from? You heard it from God. This is a divine truth that comes from God Himself. And God has given that through you. It's God's divine truth about His divine Son, the Savior, Jesus Christ. And He's here with you now. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The sermon today that I'm trying to present to you, it talks about the importance of our confession of our faith in Christ. A declaration of faith is meant to be a statement of intent. Not just mere words that you can speak from your mouth. I could go down. You know, when I'm in Evansville, I drive around on many street corners. There's somebody standing there with a cardboard sign. And I could probably stop and give them some money and say, Would you say Jesus Christ is Lord? And they say, and I, they say Sure, I will. Jesus Christ is Lord. But when you make the statement of faith, it's to be more than words. It's supposed to be from the intent of your heart and your life. This is what I believe. We behave by what we believe. And this is a declaration of faith. And Jesus said, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Our confession of what we believe about Christ is a result of our heartfelt belief in Him. Our confession is important to our relationship with Him and it's important to our witness to the rest of the world. This is stated in Romans chapter 10, verse 6 through 10. Listen. The righteousness of faith speaks in this way. The Word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. It's the Word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raising from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, man believes to righteousness. But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Are you guys listening to me? <laughs> I believe you are. I probably hollered loud enough that you got there teaching. I want to tell you how important it is what we're saying about Christ. In Matthew, Jesus said, Whosoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whosoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father in heaven. See how important our profession or our faith is. By the way, baptism is an outward sign of our confession and our belief in our heart about Him. Uh, we were missionaries in India. We were missionaries in the Philippines. We were missionaries in uh, Saipan and been to every mission field with Africa so far. But anyway, uh, they say it's hot over there. But believe you me, it's hot in India. You know in India, a lot of the people there will come to services 
and you preach the gospel to them, and they will receive the gospel, they will receive Christ, but they will not be baptized. A lot of them are hesitant to be baptized because of the fact that it's Hinduism, and if they are baptized, that means that they have bought completely their heart and soul into Jesus Christ and Christianity. And if they become Christians, they will be kicked out of their families, many of them will be. They will be pushed aside, become outcasts. Many of them will lose their jobs if they become a Christian in that Hindu society and world. They will be treated as just plain outcasts. No matter what caste they belong to, they will be an outcast to the people. And so it's hesitant for them to make an outward show of their true belief and confession. Can you understand that? But when they get baptized, that means, they, hey, by the way, before when they receive Christ and they believe that they're Christian, but the thing about it is, they call them incompleted Christians before they're baptized. They're incompleted Christians. But when they're baptized, they're all the way Christians, you see. Because why? That confession of their faith is important is saying something to the world what I believe about Jesus Christ. In, Hin in Hinduism, they worship 33 million gods and goddesses. And if that's not enough, they'll make up another. <laughs> it's the truth. They're everywhere. Temples everywhere. So when they come to Christ, though, they realize all other gods are gone. And Jesus, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. Isn't it interesting that uh, when Jesus raised from the dead, and some people didn't believe that he was alive again? Even one of the disciples had problems believing he was alive. And that was Thomas. He wasn't there when he came the first time. But when he came again, Thomas was there. And he said, I'm not going to believe it unless I, well, I can feel the nail pinch in his hand and put my hand in his thigh. I will not believe. But when he came, and Jesus was there that time, and Jesus said to him, okay, Thomas, come, he said, and feel and see. And Thomas didn't have to feel. Thomas saw him alive, and Thomas said, my Lord and my God. A confession of his faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. The confession is an important part of our relationship. If you love somebody enough, you'll usually confess that you love them. Some pray. If you don't say it with your lips, you're going to say it with your life. You're going to be doing something for them. You're going to be loving them. And you confess your relationship. It's a vow, a covenant, sealed statement of a relationship. One meant to last a lifetime. The question is, what do you say about Jesus? What are we saying about Jesus? What are we telling this world about Jesus? Are we glad we have him as our Savior? but we don't say anything about it when we're out there in the world with people. Then we're not confessing and professing our faith. But Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. If you don't, I'll deny it. How about that? Wow. That's pretty solemn, isn't it? Jesus Christ is the divine Son of God, the only Savior in the world. This is a confession that we, the church, should be saying about Him. We should be saying this with not only our lips, but with our lives. With our every heartbeat, with our every breath of our being, with every step of our feet, with every work of our hands. It needs to be some way a witness of who our Lord and Savior is, Jesus Christ. For the glory of God. And by the way, in the second chapter of Philippians, 
It says that Jesus humbled himself and became obedient in the death, even the death of the cross. And therefore, God has exalted him and given him a name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And when we confess him before men, we are giving glory to God the Father. Amen? Yeah. A shorter statement of that throughout the New Testament is the statement, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord. You know one of the great confessional statements in the Old Testament is found in the most one of the most common psalms that all of us know, the 23rd Psalm. When David said, the Lord is my shepherd. That's a statement of faith. A statement of faith. The Lord is my shepherd. That's like saying the Lord is my God. And by the way, Jesus is God. He is God. I live for Him. I confess my faith in Him. What are you confessing about Jesus Christ? Not only just with your lips, but with your lips, but with your life. What are you saying about Him? Are you saying, hey, guess what? I want you to be my Savior, okay? Hey, He's the best friend I've got. He, he's my Lord. I, I want you to be my Lord. Hey, how about that? Wouldn't you want to do that? Like the lady said to that other lady, I want you to meet my pastor. <laughs> I, I just assumed that she was proud of her pastor, but after that conversation, I'm not so sure she was. But anyway, the people that we love, the people that we care about, the people that are on our heart, the, the people that are the greatest to us, they'll say, Hey, I want you to meet them. Hey, that is our confession of faith. Hey, I want you to meet my Lord, my Savior. I want you to meet him. What are you saying about him? When's the last time you ever even invited anybody to come to church, by the way? Are you just glad that you can be there? Or are you glad that other people to know where you found him? You want them to come and find him too. Folks, we're slipping a little bit. Sometimes we go about our own life. And we're doing this and we're doing that. But we forget that we're supposed to be living for the glory of God and confessing Him and introducing Him to others as Lord. Yeah. There's an old hymn that says, My life, my love I give to Thee, the Lamb of God who died for me. Oh, may I ever faithful be, my Savior and my God. O oh, Thou who died on Calvary to save my soul and make me free, I'll consecrate my life to Thee, my Savior and my God. I'll live for Him who died for me. How happy then my life will be. I'll live for Him who died for me, my Savior and my God. Will you stand with me this morning? Here's a confession. Would you repeat it after me this morning? God is our Father. God is our Father. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our Savior. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Bible is our book. The Bible is our book. The church is our family. The church is our family. And heaven is our home. And heaven is our home. And Jesus Christ is Lord. And Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you today. Hey, while we're standing, is it okay? Would you come up here and help me with something? Can you sing, He is Lord? Yeah, can you do that? Let's sing that song together, He is Lord. Okay.
let's go sing that song out there, okay? <laughs> out there for Jesus. And he is Lord. We have a closing song this morning. And this closing song today, if you have a need for prayer, perhaps you've never met Jesus today in your life. You need to know him. If you believe in him in your heart, then you confess him as your Savior. I believe that's very important. I think that's the reason why it's been a tradition in our church through the years to say, if you become a Christian, come. Let us know about it, okay? Or if you're coming to Christ, come. Jesus' invitation was always, come. Come to me, come to me, come to him. If you're here this morning and don't know the Lord, it's a good day to know Jesus today. Or if you're here this morning and maybe you slipped it, he's not really... You're not letting be all the Lord of your life that He needs to be, and you know it. And maybe you want to come this morning and say, Hey, I'm going to dedicate myself to let Him be the Lord of my life. You come. Said? Amen. Amen. God bless you.